Welcome to another edition of Weather School, Monday, April the 6th. This one is all about hurricanes and how they affect Arkansas. And yes, hurricanes do impact our weather from time to time, and we're about to go into hurricane season in a couple of months. Thank you all for joining me here for this uh, edition of Weather School. I've got videos I'm going to show you. Uh, and an explanation of hurricanes and the parts of the hurricane, you, if there is a hurricane you want to be in, and the parts you don't want to be in. Now, if I had a choice, I'd choose that we wouldn't ever be in any part of a hurricane, or at least remnant. And you hear that a lot, remnants of hurricanes. That's what affects Arkansas. Everybody filed in, share this, tweet this, teachers, parents, because this is going to be a fantastic, I hope it's going to be a fantastic educational resource and I'm going to answer your questions. The first thing I'm going to do right now is show you, this is about a two to three minute long video, compliments of NOAA, of how hurricanes develop and form. And I'm gonna go even more into that about how they affect Arkansas. So here's, again, this video, compliments of NOAA, about two to three minutes long. We've all heard that hurricanes are one of the most powerful and destructive forces on Earth. But did you ever wonder where they get their strength? The formation of a hurricane is complicated, but basically it depends on three factors. First, you need warm water, at least 80 degrees. The second ingredient is moist air. And finally, there needs to be converging winds for a hurricane to form. The actual process begins with a cluster of thunderstorms moving across the surface of the ocean. When the surface water is warm, the storm sucks up heat energy from the water, just like a straw sucks up a liquid. This creates moisture in the air. If wind conditions are right, the storm becomes a hurricane. This heat energy is the fuel for the storm and the warmer the water, the more moisture is in the air. And that could mean bigger and stronger hurricanes. Satellite data shows the heat and energy transfer in action. Notice how this hurricane leaves a trail of cooler water behind. Scientists use sea surface temperature data from satellites to help forecast the intensity of storms. Hurricane Katrina, which was the third largest to make landfall in the U.S., crossed over Gulf waters that had temperatures between 2 and 3 degrees higher than normal. This spawned sustained winds of over 140 miles per hour, extending 100 miles from the eye of the storm. And with greater intensity, there's a higher chance for death and destruction. This is why warming ocean temperatures matter. It's like adding fuel to a fire and taking the world, literally, by storm. All right. I hope you enjoyed that little video. And now on to uh, what I want to show you. Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button here. Uh, hurricanes. Uh, again, this is um, a little lesson on how they affect Arkansas. This is visible satellite imagery of a hurricane, obviously. You see the eye in the center. Let's dissect that eye and look at this. Again, you have to know the storm direction. If this is moving from the bottom or the middle of the screen to the top of the screen, you're in the front right quadrant. If you're in that red shaded area, that's where you do not want to be. That's where the maximum impact is found, in that right front quadrant. Remember, the storm direction is going north. That's where you have maximum impact. On the left quadrant, it can still, especially just to the very top of that, on the right side of that, you can still get very significant, uh, you can get tornadoes even, but you are in the left front, it's significant in terms of the storm surge. The back right quadrant, still dangerous, but if there's one quadrant you want to be in, if there's a hurricane, it's in the southwestern quadrant of the storm. So we divide it up into four quadrants. The northeastern one is always the one you don't want to be in. It's an incredible satellite imagery. You know that we rate hurricanes 
uh, categorize them according to the, their wind speeds. It's called the Saffir-Simpson scale. And for a storm to become a hurricane, it has to have winds of 74 miles per hour or greater. Again, 74 miles per hour or greater for it to be called a hurricane. And it becomes a category one, usually minimal damage. But this is, uh, if you are along the coastal areas, the impacts would become much greater at category two. You start to see an increase in storm surge and the wind 96 to 110 miles per hour. Once it gets to category three, it becomes a major hurricane. And that's very important because I'm going to show you a forecast for this upcoming season about how many major hurricanes are anticipated for this coming uh, tropical season. But a Category 3, a Cat 3, this is different from what you see with uh, tornadoes with enhanced Vegeta scale. This is the Saffir Simpson scale. Category 3, 111 to 129 miles per hour. Devastating damage. Look at the storm surge. It starts to build in, and that's the number one related killer it's not the wind, it's the storm surge, the inland flooding. That's what makes hurricanes so dangerous in terms of taking uh, people's lives. That's why you always see evacuations right along the coastal areas because of that storm surge. Extreme winds, category four, 130 miles per hour to 156 miles per hour. That's catastrophic. And a category five. There is no such thing as anything more than a category five. That's catastrophic damage. You can expect homes and, and well-constructed uh, structures to be swept off their foundations. And I have video that I'm going to show you in just a little bit inside a Category 5 hurricane from our partners at Live Storms Media. That's coming up in just a little bit. Now, we're going to get to the names of this, but of tropical systems, but the uh, timing here of when we see it ramp up in the Atlantic Basin Tropical season begins typically right around right at June 1st, but look how it stays low throughout the summer right here. There's June 20th. There's July 10th. It starts to come up a little bit, especially into August. It peaks around September 10th every year. This is based on climatology, and then it starts to go back down. So once the ocean temperatures heat up in the spring and summertime, it utilizes that energy. It utilizes it as fuel from the summertime heat, and that it takes a while for the ocean to warm up, and that's why we see the lag here where it really starts to crank up on September 10th, typically the peak. So weatherbell.com came out with their forecast about a month ago uh, with their chief uh, meteorologist Joe Vistardi, and they're calling for this season to have 14 to 20 named storms, a little above average. 7 to 11 will be hurricanes, and remember I told you it was very important to know what a major hurricane is. Well, three to six will be major hurricanes. Now remember, that sounds scary and hurricanes are scary. But the big question, will they hit land? Because sometimes these hurricanes form, they don't hit anything. That's what we hope what will happen. But of course, coastal areas always have to be prepared. The names of the storms this year, the first one, Arthur, then you go down the list. And again, they're alphabetical. And if you get all the way to the very end of that list, uh, then we start using, and this is something you may not know, we start using the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, and we go to that. And that has happened before in the past. So there's the list of hurricanes for this season. Uh, Arthur, Bertha, Cristobal, Dolly, and it goes all the way through that list down to Wilfred at the very end. Let's hope we don't get to that period. Hurricanes, again, and their remnants do affect Arkansas. Historic tropical tracks. This is since the year 2000 through 2019, tracks within 500 miles of Arkansas. And each one of those represents a tropical system. Now remember, they feed off of ocean water, warm ocean water. Once they leave that warm ocean water, they leave the fuel. However, the wind energy may come down some, but they're loaded with moisture. And they dump a lot of rain. And remember, you don't want to be on the right side or one of those quadrants. Remember those quadrants that I showed you? You don't want to be on there. But you see Arkansas from time from time to time, we are in that right quadrant. As far as we're concerned, they're better when they go east of the state because we have minimal impacts. However, when they cross the state, here's Isaac. I remember Isaac coming up through the state. So everybody on this side, we had terrible flooding. I believe that's from Isaac uh, through Jefferson County. On the right side of this, this was several years ago. 
Matthew came up even in the southeastern Arkansas, brought heavy rain. Grace. Again, th these are all from the past almost 20 years. Barry, you see right there, was one of the more recent ones. Just last, uh, and Barry's this blue line right in here. Just last uh, summer, and it brought the most amount of rain of any tropical system in Arkansas, recorded Arkansas history in southwest Arkansas, a little bit more than 16 inches of rain within a 24-hour period. Again, that's the main threat when we deal with hurricanes in Arkansas or tropical storms, the remnants. The main threat, it is uh, inland flooding, and it's also tornadoes on that right side. Now, we're not done yet. I also want to go and uh, show you, I had the opportunity that I'm going to take you inside a hurricane now from an aircraft, and I'm going to take you inside the hurricane down on the coast from our live stores media partner just a couple of years ago in Hurricane Matthew, which was a devastating hurricane for Florida. Now, I had the opportunity in 2008 to fly with the hurricane hunters through Hurricane Ike in the northern Gulf of Mexico. I had to travel to Biloxi, Mississippi, where they take off from Keesler Air Force Base, and we traveled down to the Gulf of Mexico and made several passes through the eye of the storm and came back, and I got back to Little Rock, and then I had to cover the tornadoes and the flooding that it produced. So I believe this is the video right here. Our day started around 11 a.m., departing Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Our destination, Hurricane Ike in the Central Gulf, it only takes about a couple of hours to reach the eye. Well, we're beginning to experience some significant turbulence through the eye wall of, of Hurricane Ike, traveling at about 10,000 feet above the ocean surface. What we're finding out right now is that Hurricane Ike is going through an eye wall replacement cycle. It's actually weakening just a little bit before it strengthens once again. The maximum sustained winds are around 100 miles per hour, which keeps it a Category 2. Knowing exactly what's going on right now outside of this aircraft is very important in knowing how Ike will impact Arkansas's weather down the road. Once we reach the eye, we can see all the way to the ocean surface. Even at this altitude, the white-capped waves are easily seen. After several passes through the eye, dropping weather instruments out of the aircraft, there's good news and bad news. The good? The hurricane isn't getting any stronger. The bad? We received information that a man has fallen off a boat in the northern Gulf. Our flight has been diverted to help in a rescue mission. They went ahead and sat-copped us, satellite communications directly to me, and asked if there's any way we could go check out the specific Latin bomb. They thought that, that that's where the man might be. And that's how we found out, and we all agreed that we thought we could fit it in, and, and that's exactly what we did. For the search, we dropped from 10,000 feet to a mere 2,000 feet. The waves look so close feels like you can reach out and touch them. We estimate the wave heights are around 30 to 40 feet. All the crew members gather around windows looking for anything that indicates the man is there. Sometimes people have been lucky though. The, the unfortunate thing was he didn't have a life raft, which, and usually they're orange, or, or even a life suit's orange. So that kind of helps tremendous if they are wearing those, but he was just in plain day clothes, we think. So uh, the chances of finding him are, are unfortunately extremely slim. It's missions like this one the men and women of the Weather Reconnaissance Squadron trained for, a training that all began right here in Arkansas. Any J model, E model, H model, we're trained at Little Rock. So anybody that's on this aircraft, except for the weather officer, has gone through the course at Little Rock, has flown on the aircraft at Little Rock, and we sit there, we go training up to from three months up to a year with the training at Little Rock. While in a strange way, the eye wall is peaceful from 10,000 feet, each person on this C-130 knows the devastation it can unleash on the surface. You guys are probably flying, not following not just this storm, but Gustav that came through, probably headed up your way as well. So it's not just the coastal communities that are interested. And that was my experience through... Uh, Hurricane Ike, and then it eventually affected Arkansas. So again, these storms that develop in the Atlantic Basin, which includes the Gulf of Mexico, can, and if they typically do impact Arkansas, it's in the summertime into the early fall. And the main threat here in Arkansas is inland flooding, heavy rain, and there can be brief tornadoes with some of these uh, if you're on that right side of the storm. So those are the things that we usually have to watch. 
Once we get into October, it's very rare for any remnant system to affect Arkansas because the jet stream starts to shift from the north to the south as we go into winter. And if there's any storm development, it's usually shunted off towards the east. Now, that was Hurricane Ike. As you know, that we had uh, a terrible, we've had several terrible hurricane seasons affect places like Puerto Rico and uh, the eastern United States, Florida. Our partners at Live Storms Media, I want to take you inside Matthew uh, as it devastated the Florida Panhandle. Look at this video. This is a Category 5 hurricane. You can hear the roar of the wind. This is Panama City, which did not take a direct hit, but took a big hit from this hurricane. From Brandon Clement with our partners at Livestorm Media, you can see pieces of the roof getting blown apart. This is all within the eye wall, very close to the eye, which passed, I believe if I remember correctly, just to the east of Panama City. So they're not even in the worst part of it. Where the worst part was hit uh, was around Mexico Beach. It's amazing some of those structures were able to stand. They didn't in Mexico Beach. I'll show you a video from Mexico Beach just a little bit. I'll show you this incredible video from inside one of the worst hurricanes ever been. Listen to that roar. This is exactly why people are evacuating away from the coast because that wind is pushing the ocean water into the coastal communities and that's called storm surge. And storm surge, remember, is the number one killer inside the earth. It's not the wind, it's the storm surge. It's an incredible video. Here's video from Kate Sam Flats from Brandon Clement. You can see the hurricane in the afternoons. Carpets own units destroyed the road of the And again, Dr. Disurviving. Look at the story. Look at the road. How it is. Storm storm. All that And this is Mexico Beach, ground zero for when that hurricane hit from Brandon Clement and our partners at Live Storms Media. Once again, this is why local officials. That's why they evacuate and tell those coastal communities to get out and go further inland. You see the structures were completely wiped away from their foundations. Look at all of the debris. You see a well-built structure off in the distance that was able to withstand it, but many of them did not. All right, so I've completed my presentation. And I'm going to answer your questions. Plus, I, I'm asking you to, I'm going to make this interactive and, uh, you know, you can go ahead and uh, ask a question. But I'm going to ask you, if you have any ideas for future weather lessons, please let me know. Because I love putting this together. This didn't take me all that long to put together yesterday. And I'm more than happy. This will be posted on the Arkansas Weather Blog again a little bit later on. So if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, again, at 1.30, the press conference begins. So I'm going to leave the last few minutes here for any questions. I don't have any questions coming in. I think fine. Here we go. 
Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. <laughs> Here's one. How does the category scale work? Well, again, remember, it's a Saffir-Simpson scale, and it's named after the people who developed it. But a Category 1 is the smallest, is the weakest. It's a Category 1 a hurricane is the weakest of all hurricanes. And then it, once it gets up to Category 3, it increases as the winds increase and the, the damages with it that uh, it increases as well exponentially. The uh, Category 3 is when we get into what's called a major hurricane. And unfortunately, that happens quite a bit, especially when the upper-level winds have to be very light. That makes it favorable. And the ocean temperatures have to be warm, 80 degrees or higher. When you have that, that's the fuel that uh, really gets these hurricanes going. You can have all that warm ocean water, but if the winds aloft are strong, it'll shear everything apart and you won't get any developed. But when the winds are light enough, it starts this engine, this mechanism that gets them going. And once they leave that fuel, that warm ocean water, they begin to weaken its wind energy, but its flooding threat actually can increase. All right. Well, a tsunami forms, uh, as uh, Taylor asks, how does a tsunami form? A tsunami forms uh, from an earthquake underneath the ocean, uh, on the ocean floor, when you have a strike slip fault, I think is what they're called. I'm not sure. I'm not, don't quote me on that. But when you have two plates and one goes like that, and that can create a tsunami if they go like that. Usually, if, they, if, if you have two plates and they go, and the, and the earthquake is called and they slide, that usually doesn't create a tsunami. It's when the plates, one goes under another like that. Uh, plate tectonics, a lot of fun studying that. Maybe that'll be a lesson down the fu uh, in the future. That's what usually creates tsunamis, but they're not related to hurricanes. Storm surge, though, related to hurricanes, and they're sort of like tsunamis. Would we be safe in the basement? Absolutely. However, remember flooding and storm surge uh, if you live in a coastal community. You best to get out. Here's a great question from Rachel. When do you retire a hurricane's name? Well, uh, we don't, but the uh, I believe the National Hurricane Center of the World Meteorological Organization, one of them, one of those entities will retire the names, but when it causes widespread death and destruction, they will retire the name and never use it again. For instance, we'll never see a Matthew again. We're never going to see a Katrina again. I mean, we will in terms of the damage. It will happen again at some point, hopefully not in our lifetime. I hope it never happens. But as far as the name of that, those are retired and those names are no longer used. When they cause widespread death and destruction, they will uh, retire the names. Here's another great question from Catherine Kitchens. How long can a hurricane stay active? As long as it has that warm ocean water to feed off of. And as long as the shear, the winds aloft are light, they can last. I've seen them travel, uh, the clusters of thunderstorms developing off the African coastline, and they'll travel all the way across the Atlantic, and they can last for sometimes two to three weeks at the very most. Now, uh, typically, if a hurricane reaches Category 5 status, it has that is a perfectly fine-tuned engine. And at some point, just the most minor disruption to that engine can cause it to weaken. So if a hurricane does get to Category 5 status, it's very difficult for it to maintain that status for a long period of time, and it starts to weaken. But even then, it's still extremely dangerous, and we don't ever want to see them ramp up right before they hit landfall. Very tough to predict. Uh, we're, more, we're better at predicting the location, the track of these systems. What's very difficult is forecasting the intensity of these because they can quickly ramp up their intensity, and it just takes one small thing. Uh, it can entrain incredible amounts of dry air. Uh, it can hit a little bit of wind shear, and it will disrupt the storm. So those are the things that are very difficult in forecasting is the intensity, not so much the track, although that still has its challenges. This is a great question from Susan. How can you tell how fast the winds are? Well, from instrumentation, but like what I showed you on that uh, video, radio sonds, I'm sorry, I should call them drop sonds, are released out of the aircraft. That's why the hurricane hunters who are trained right here at the Little Rock Air Force Base, they go through a training and they fly through these hurricanes and they drop those instruments out of the belly of the aircraft and they measure the winds, the humidity, the temperature, everything all the way down to the surface. 
it collects that information and sends it to the National Hurricane Center. That information is also put into computer models to help forecast what these hurricanes are going to do, where it's going to track, they, and, and how strong it could get. But they drop those instruments all throughout the aircraft. I can't even remember how many we dropped out there, but it was a lot because they make what are called alpha patterns. They go through these making an alpha pattern and they drop these instruments all around the, uh, they drop those instruments all around the uh, tropical system. We're about to end this now, and again, this will be posted on the Arkansas Weather Blog. Um, what is the safest place to be in a hurricane? Well, if you're on the coast, uh, the safest place is to get away from the coast and to find shelter well inland. But again, sort of like tornadoes, uh, you don't want to be near windows because they can shatter. And the lowest level, however, on the lowest level, you also have to be uh, a keen awareness of, of the uh, threat for some flooding in that storm surge. But the best thing to do is to listen to your local officials on the coast and know when to get out. All right. I think that's going to be about it. Uh, again, if you have any lessons that you would like me to uh, come up with, any future weather lessons, please let me know. Uh, send me a, a message on Facebook, an email, or, or, or ask me on Twitter, uh, and I will be more than happy to uh, put together another lesson. I hope to have another one next week, whether lesson number four, and so on and so on. I hope all the kids out there uh, keep smiling and keep learning uh, and stay safe out there, and I hope everybody stays well. Thank you so much for trusting us here at Channel 7, the team with the most experience.